Welcome to this presentation for Unit 6, which deals with intercultural communication and context. We're going to be talking mostly about professional contexts and uh, especially the business world. But we're going to start by talking about the environmental context and how interactions and conversations, encounters are affected by where they take place. And that's obvious in certain ways in terms of, of quiet and loud uh, where that conversation um, happens, but it's also the case that um, it's different in different environments such as in the family, in a home uh, <coughs> environment or in a work environment. Um, it can also be affected by other physical aspects of the setting. And one of the ways that um, that's often described in terms of talking about the environment and its impact on conversations is to refer to the information load. And that's how much data is coming to you from the setting in, in which the conversation takes place. And so uh, a high load information um, setting uh, would be something where there's a lot going on, where there are a lot of people, where there may be a lot of chaos, very dynamic, changing situation, as opposed to low load um, information setting where things are quiet, there might just be one person there or no, nobody at, at all. Um, it's very familiar. And um, the general sense of, of how conversations differ in those um, different environments is that um, the higher the information load, the more uncertainty there is, uh, the more anxiety one might um, have in the conversation, and the greatest source of un uh, uncertainty and anxiety are other people, particularly uh, w when they're from different cultures. And so as a consequence, people are likely, whenever possible, to avoid high-load environments just like the one that we're going to see in the following clip. So there you have a high load um, information setting um, where there's a lot going on and where the person is feeling a little bit uh, overwhelmed and where as a consequence uh, conversations are going to potentially be problematic. So uh, <clears throat> in terms of environments, uh, where conversations normally take place is in buildings, the so-called built uh, environment. And um, this can vary, obviously, uh, from culture to culture, but this is a human universal uh, that we need shelter, obviously. Edward Hall talked about um, three layout patterns for housing. And uh, one of the, the predominant one is fixed feature space, where you have walls, floors, and other aspects um, of the uh, rooms and buildings that are, that are um, built in and not movable. Um, we'll see that in Japan, there's uh, considerable use of what's called semi-fixed feature space uh, that's more flexible and customizable. Then you have informal space. Um, in settings like um, outside where, where there are no boundaries or no fixed features. 
So let's talk about um, Japanese, traditional Japanese housing, which is um, quite interesting. And to, traditionally, these are designed for extended families. And one of the important features of traditional housing in Japan is that uh, the houses are supposed to be in harmony with nature. And one of the ways that that's done is that there, there is typically a sitting room um, that opens up uh, onto a garden. And the Japanese garden um, is an important part of the way of life, uh, traditional way of life in Japan. Um, one of the other main aspects of uh, traditional housing in Japan is this idea of modular design. And so the so-called shoji, um, which are, <clears throat> um, um, which are, um, look like this, um, those are movable, <clears throat> made of, uh, of uh, so that they're semi-transparent. These screens pro uh, provide privacy, but also a great deal of flexibility. In terms of, uh, of also flexibility, you have these floor mats uh, made from bamboo, tatami, that can be reconfigured depending on how the space is divided up. Um, so a very different kind of uh, house design than, than you have uh, in Western countries. So I'll go back here to the toilet, <laughs> which is very high tech. Um, actually, this is, <coughs> excuse me, a picture of a, a toilet in a, in a Korean hotel that, that, uh, where I stayed <coughs> a couple of years ago. It's very similar in Japan. And uh, if you don't know the language, you probably have a hard time. There's some symbols. Uh, but <coughs> this is another aspect of uh, environmental design in Japan. It's very little privacy in a country that's as densely populated as Japan is. And so retreating to the bathroom is, is one way to uh, get some privacy. And privacy is uh, something that's uh, important across the board for everybody. We're social animals, but uh, at, at particular times we need to be alone. And uh, so uh, the, the, the design of, uh, of houses may or may not uh, allow uh, solitude in some ways. One might need to go outside the house. Um, that's true if you have a very small living space, um, uh, or it might be incorporated, as in Japan, in some way uh, into a special room. <clears throat> and when we talk about privacy, there are different kinds of, of, of privacy. One is uh, solitude, just uh, being by yourself with no one around. The other that is often described uh, as a feature of modern society is reserve, where you have no physical privacy. There are other people around you, but, but mentally, psychologically, um, you go into a state where you kind of ignore everybody else that's around. <clears throat> You have shared intimacy, um, uh, a shared privacy, rather, through intimacy. And then you have anonymity, where uh, you might be in a crowd with other people, uh, but, but you're just not uh, observed or not uh, distinguished in any way from anybody else. I'm going to look at a clip that illustrates the lack of privacy in today's work world. Hello, Peter. What's happening? Uh, we have sort of a problem here. Yeah, you apparently didn't put one of the new cover sheets on your TPS reports. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry about that. I, I forgot. Mm, yeah. You see, we're putting the cover sheets on all TPS reports now before they go out. Did you see the memo about this? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I have the memo right here. I just uh, forgot, but uh, it's not shipping out till tomorrow, so there's no problem. Yeah. 
If you could just go ahead and make sure you do that from now on, that would be great. And uh, I'll go ahead and make sure you get another copy of that memo. Okay? Yeah, no, I, I, I have Peter. the memo. I've got it. It's right. Hello, Phil. What's happening? Um, I came far here yesterday. Mm. Milton. Hi. Uh, could you turn that down just a little bit? But I, I was told that I could listen to the radio at a reasonable volume from 9 to 11. Yeah, no, no, I, I know you're allowed to. I, uh, I was just thinking maybe like a, you know, personal favor. You... Well, I, 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 I told Bill that if, if Sandra's going to listen to her headphones... While she's, while she's falling, then I should be able to listen to the radio while I'm collating. Uh -huh. So I don't see why okay. I should have to turn down the radio because yeah, all right. okay. I enjoy listening at a reasonable volume. Thanks. From 9 to 11. No. So there you have a modern U.S. work environment with cubicles where you have very little physical privacy, where you, uh, workers tend to uh, try to find different ways to achieve um, some kind of, uh, of privacy and that uh, done here in different, in different ways. Um, but the, the main way that, that, that one can do that um, is, is through setting oneself off mentally from the, one's coworkers. So we'll talk briefly about time. Uh, one distinguishes, this goes back to Edward Hall, two main attitudes towards time, behaviors towards time, monochronic and polychronic. Monochronic is usually associated <clears throat> with uh, low context cultures like the United States or, or uh, Northern Europe where uh, time is considered to be a very valuable commodity and is carefully segmented. Things go happen on schedules. That's very different from a polychronic orientation. Um, that's, that's typical of Southern Europe, Latin America, uh, Middle Eastern countries, where typically there are a lot of things happening at once. One doesn't necessarily wait until one thing is finished before starting something else. There might be multiple conversations going on. And obviously these different um, time orientations can affect um, interactions with people uh, from uh, different cultures. Um, one of the problems, obviously, is that um, if you're from a monochronic culture and you don't have a lot of experience with people that have different time expectations um, and norms, then th there obviously are going to be problems. Um, and one of those is the assumption is for people from um, polychronic uh, cultures uh, if, if one comes from a culture like Germany is that these people are just not serious because they're not on time, they're not keeping to the schedule. Um, on the other hand, um, people from Latin America uh, will um, see uh, the keeping too rigidly to a schedule um, as, as being uh, rude and actually counterproductive in the long run. <coughs> So in a monochronic orientation, um, things happen in a very orderly way, and for people who are used to that, being in a different polychronic uh, time situation uh, can be very chaotic uh, because often people don't line up in an orderly way. Um, their uh, customers might not be taken in the order in which they have appeared in line. Uh, and it's also the, the case in very, <clears throat> very often polychronic cultures that, um, that it's important who you know, who, that, that you have to know who to go to to get things done. Um, and that can be uh, disorienting for people who are not used to that. So what issues um, can arise um, in doing business uh, across cultures? Well, there are a number of things. One is, of course, uh, language problems, but also nonverbal. Um, how do you dress? Um, how formal that, that dress uh, is going to be? Um, how familiar you are to, with uh, business customs? How you greet people? But also how you negotiate uh, with someone? How long that takes? What are the different steps in negotiations? How do you conclude negotiations? 
uh, understanding what consumers want. If you're trying to sell something in, a, in another culture, uh, you better be familiar with both the language and the culture so you have an understanding of, of, of what the consumers are likely to want to buy. Uh, legal issues can be important um, and issues like uh, corruption depending on where the, where the country is. There might be an expectation of uh, offering bribes um, to get your, your business established or to get things done. There's, uh, in general, a distinction that one often makes of um, <clears throat> business cultures in large power distance uh, countries uh, from uh, how business is conducted in small power, power distance cultures. <clears throat> and one is that um, what's very important tends to be one's rank, social position uh, in society, uh, connections that one has uh, through work or family. And typically, the communication um, in that type of business culture is top down. There's not a, a lot of input from em employees. They're not expected to participate in de decision making. At the same, same time, very often <clears throat> in that kind of business environment, the company is run kind of like a family. And so the, the sense is that they're going to take care of, uh, of the uh, employees kind of like members of, the, of a family uh, would. So let's talk about verbal communication. I'll talk about this uh, from an American English uh, perspective and what, um, <clears throat> what sometimes happens with American business people going abroad. They tend to not be able to adapt their language and not be aware of the necessity of adapting their language to uh, what second language uh, English as uh, talking with people who have English as a, as a second language. Um, so that they will tend to use uh, vocabulary or slang that, that's unfamiliar, uh, try to use humor inappropriately. Humor sometimes just doesn't get across for language and culture uh, reasons. And so this is uh, obviously quite important. It's not just enough to know um, <clears throat> English. Um, that's, that's the lingua franca in the business world today, internationally. But um, you have to adapt your English um, to the situation. Uh, what can uh, arise non-verbally? How to greet someone? Um, in what order? Who do you who do you shake hands with first? That might seem uh, unimportant, but in a lot of cultures, it's very important uh, that that you greet first the most important person, the person with the highest status. Um, how close do you get to the person that you're talking to? Uh, where do you sit um, in Japan, for example? At a business meeting, um, seating is very carefully arranged in terms of the uh, uh, person with the most seniority and the highest status where that person goes and then uh, who's closest to him is this person second in status and so forth. So here are some um, uh, ways in which uh, one often talks about um, cultural aspects of doing business internationally. Often these cultural taxonomies are used as a starting point. In other words, individualism versus collectivism, um, power distance, um, those things that we talked about uh, in, in the very first unit uh, of this course. Um, there's a danger for doing that uh, in terms of lumping countries together and assuming, for example, that all European countries are the same. You conduct business in France and Germany in, in a very similar way. Uh, nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, they, they share a lot of <clears throat> cultural values and behaviors, um, France and Germany and other Western European countries, but in terms of business, they're very, very different. <clears throat> and the same is true of Japan and China, which often link together uh, the countries in the Middle East uh, as well. Um, the importance of culture in doing business uh, is, uh, is demonstrated by a thriving business in the United States, and I suspect in other countries as well, offering uh, courses in cultural sensitivity or intercultural communication. Um, that uh, that's a a, a a booming business in in the United States. One of the things to be aware of um, in terms of international business is the role of women, which varies dramatically uh, in, uh, in from country to country. In Western Europe, for example, there are, in some countries there are quotas for women on, on, on uh, company boards. 
uh, as well as quotas for the number of women in, in uh, national legislatures uh, and parliaments. Um, and um, in, in Western Europe in particular, there are lots of benefits um, for women that are not available in um, a lot of other countries. Um, and in a lot of cultures, there, there are many barriers for women to be taken seriously um, in the business world. Um, and there's generally a preference for hiring men. Um, and it, it, it's too bad because women have a very distinctive and positive management style. I think that's been pretty universally recognized that women are consensus makers, that they look for input, uh, as much input um, from a diversity of opinions as possible, and then try to reach a consensus, um, which is a very positive way of, of decision making. Well, we're going to um, look at um, a couple of different business cultures, and we're going to start by looking at business culture in Japan. And we'll look at the um, exchange of business cards. Please take a close look at, at the angle that these men are bowing at. Now, if this is the right way to bow, and this is the wrong way to bow. And take a look at the importance of the angle of the feet. Now let's take a look at some of the finer details of where you're actually supposed to hold the card. When you exchange business cards in Japan, it's important to hold the corner of the business card and not cover your company logo or your own name with your thumb. This is considered bad manners in Japan. You must remember to hold a corner of the business card. When you receive a business card, it's important to hold it with both hands and holding it over your meishi case. You should never, ever put away your business card quickly and put it away in your pockets. You must display respect by holding it over your meishi case. Let's take a final view of how to exchange business cards right. Now you can get in line and try to get a job in Japan like the rest of us. So there's a set ritual in Japan for how to, how to exchange business cards. One of the things that's uh, important um, in Japan and um, in other countries that have a non-Roman uh, alphabet is that very often the business card will have the English on the reverse uh, side. <clears throat> and the behavior that, that you see here in the business community is typical of the kind of ritualized behavior that's uh, seen in other aspects of, of life in Japan. In that sense, business culture uh, always mirrors the, the national culture. One of the issues that American <coughs> business people have um, in doing business in Japan is uh, they're used to being very informal. That's uh, not typically the case in, in Japan. There's uh, also there are communication issues in the sense that Japanese tend to fairly be fairly indirect in their communication style, um, heavy use of, of silence, which is kind of awkward for um, American business people. Uh, the Japanese equivalent um, of yes is hi, but hi actually culturally is used in a lot of different ways. It can mean yes, um, but it also can mean I hear you. <laughs> it doesn't necessarily mean I, I agree uh, with, with, with what, what you're saying. There's also a very strong sense of corporate social responsibility in Japan uh, that's kind of unique. Uh, when there's a major issue um, that uh, occurs that's the fault of the company, uh, typically there'll, there'll be um, 
a, a spokesperson for the company and very often a high-ranking person like the president or CEO of a company who in a, in a very public way will apologize and bow very deeply. Uh, for example, the, the CEO of Sony did that a few years ago when there was a breach of, uh, of, of names uh, and other information for, that was uh, hacked into uh, from um, people using the Sony PlayStation. So uh, Japanese business decisions uh, are based on uh, what's good for the company, but also on what's good for employees. Um, it's not as absolute a capitalist system as in the United States, where profit, the bottom line, is profit, and that's um, really the, the only focus of the company. Um, in Japan, uh, there was this kind of, uh, for a long time, <clears throat> sense that um, the company owed something to employees, just like the employees owed something to the company. And one of those guarantees was lifetime employment um, with the financial problems in, uh, in the uh, last few decades. That's uh, less the case. It's also less the case in Japan that everything works according to seniority. Um, one of the aspects of, of uh, work in Japan is this tradition of Taizo, um, morning exercise, um, which uh, in, um, in other cultures can be problematic. We're going to look at a clip uh, that illustrates that. having a good beginning. Yeah, well, see, these guys aren't really used to getting up in the morning. I do not blame you, even though you are the leader. OK, sit tight. I say we do it. Oh, bullshit, man. Oh, man. Come on. Why not? We never exercise. Come on. You know what this is like? You know what this is? It's like the first week in high school. If you wore jeans, you got in big trouble. Right by October, they didn't care if you wore pants, which you didn't a couple times. <laughs> oh, no, that one time. All right. But anyway, do it a couple days. Don't forget about it. I'm telling you. Duck hop. Duck hop. OK. <laughs> So this is from a movie that um, one must uh, say uh, provides a rather exaggerated picture of both the Japanese and um, U.S. Uh, work environment. This portrays a Japanese company taking over a, a car factory in the United States. This is the first day that you just saw in that clip. What's the point of exercising together? Um, well, it's, it, it's good uh, physically for the health uh, of the employees, um, and there are breaks throughout the day, typically in Japanese factories, for people to, to exercise. But it's also uh, intended to, to build uh, team spirit, um, a sense of company morale, uh, 
executives join in and that demonstrates that they're a part uh, of the family uh, as well. So let's talk briefly about a uh, situation in Germany, very different from Japan, very direct communication style. Um, Germans tend to be very blunt and say what it is they think and they find facts more important than politeness or, or, or maintaining face. Um, so honesty is, is favored. <clears throat> And there's this German saying that Ordnung muss sein, um, the, there must be order, uh, the sense that uh, there's a place for everything and a time for everything. And if you go to a, a, a German house, everything is very orderly and, and, and kept in its, in its particular place. Um, in Germany, um, leadership is awarded uh, according to talent and um, uh, what one has demonstrated as uh, as ability in, in one's position. That's more important than who you know or even any academic uh, degree that you have. Germany has this system of apprenticeship um, which is uh, very uh, <coughs> well regarded um, and uh, fairly unique and, and works well in, in, in terms of making skilled workers available um, through a systematic um, system of education uh, where there are technical schools that are very highly regarded and um, that, that continue traditions that have been around in Germany for a long time. Here's an illustration of some of the things that you don't want to do uh, in conducting business in Germany. It appears as though he's running a little bit late and didn't plan ahead to give himself enough time to make it to the meeting. At least he remembered to spit his gum out. A little bit of a slip there on the steps. Now folks, it's always good to be prepared, unlike Matt here. It looks like he's struggling to even find out where his meeting is. So punctuality is very important in Germany. Don't, don't even be a few minutes late. Uh, be early if, if possible. Be formal uh, in your use of, of language. Do your homework. The Germans will know a lot about you and they expect you to be knowledgeable as well. There's this German saying, Dienst ist Dienst and Schnapps ist Schnapps. Work is work and, uh, and, and, and Schnapps is Schnapps, liquor is liquor. Uh, the, the idea is that when you're at work, you're going to work hard, you're not going to be doing other things. If you're working at a fast food restaurant, you're not going to be talking with other employees about your date the night before or the shift times, uh, but you're actually going to be working the whole time. You're not going to be doing, uh, if you're in an office environment, you're not going to be making personal phone calls or personal emails. And then when work is over, uh, Germans like to play hard and drink hard, um, but there's a sharp division between the work life and the personal life in, in Germany, much more so than is the case in the United States. <clears throat> in Germany, doing business, um, it's great if you know some German, but uh, in general, Germans are, are, are pretty good at English, uh, particularly in uh, business, business people. It's great if you know a little bit about German culture, uh, if, you, if you can talk about German classical music, if you've read some books by German authors, uh, that, that's a big plus. Mexico. Um, so we're going to see a, a clip here um, about business practices in Mexico. 
Uh, the attitude towards work is quite different than it is in Germany. Uh, work as a necessary uh, evil um, and uh, competition is not as important as cooperation is different from the United States in that, in that sense. Uh, it is important in Mexico who you know and what your relationship is with important people. There's a fairly rigid uh, hierarchy. So let's take a, a look at this clip about um, Mexican uh, business etiquette. Monica, could you tell us when I meet somebody, how do I greet them? You know, do I shake hands? Do, to how do I address them? Well, um, it is important to distinguish whether you are talking in business or having an informal conversation. For instance, when you um, are conducting business, it's important to the use of titles. Um, it is very common the practice of uh, using the title of the coming from the bachelor or the master's degree, also depending on the hierarchical status, director, Mr. Director, or the profession like doctor. Um, in the case of women, it is very interesting to see that we keep um, or we remain with a maiden name and uh, when we get married, we use or adopt the husband's family name. For example, in my case, my maiden name is Monica Lopez, my husband's family name is Gonzalez. So my married name is Monica Lopez de Gonzalez. So it is important to keep in mind all these aspects as far as how do you address to people, no? Um, also, it is very important to ask for help when pronouncing names, for instance. In Spanish, we have stronger sounds um, than the ones that we have in English. It is Jose and not Jose, for instance, or Jorge instead of Jorge. So if you keep in mind all those things, um, you can be very well accepted. So people appreciate if you are aware of that and you pronounce things correctly and address them correctly with that. So greetings are important, knowing how to greet people, knowing titles, knowing being able to pronounce names and knowing how names work um, in Mexico and Latin America in, in, generally, in general. Knowledge of Spanish is probably more important than knowledge of Germany. German is uh, in, in conducting business there um, because English skills can, can vary quite a, a bit. <clears throat> there are also uh, many nonverbal differences there between Mexico and, and Germany. Let's talk about China very briefly, and here again we'll watch a short clip. This is a huge mar market, obviously, for businesses, and so there's a lot of interest worldwide in, in conducting business and having partnerships in, in China. Uh, <clears throat> in China, it's very important to get to know your business partner. Um, that uh, that um, it might take time, uh, might take going out uh, to eat together, uh, drink together. Uh, very often business lunches involve a lot of, of liquor. Um, that's important. And typically in China, management is responsible for all decision making. Um, it's not a uh, shared responsibility as in um, certain business cultures. Um, one of the things that's important in, uh, in China is reaching consensus and that sometimes has to be done through uh, mediation. Third party mediators tend to be uh, important in different aspects of Chinese culture. Business is one of those. Finding a, finding a, a romantic partner is, is another. Gift giving uh, traditionally was important in business culture in Japan becoming less so because there's been a, a statewide, um, uh, from, uh, from the top of the Communist Party, a, a, <coughs> a national crackdown on, on corruption in China. So let's take a look at this short clip about um, business etiquette. Guanxi is a term central to the Chinese business culture that, simply put, means relationships or connections. Establishing these long-term, respect-based, and supportive relationships is the primary way to succeed in business within the society. Dress is generally conservative, so stick with subdued colors. Men are expected to wear jackets for meetings and dinners. Likewise, women should wear business suits taking care to select blouses with high necklines and to avoid being much taller than your host, shoes with little or no heel. Mr. Johnson? 
Hi. Hi, Section Chief Yon will be pleased to know you're early. I'm Lee Wen, his assistant. It's nice to meet you. I'm Jack Johnson, and this is my boss, Chantel Edwards. Oh, your boss? The concept of mian zi is a very important part of the Chinese culture. Similar to the concept of respect, mian zi revolves around maintaining a good image or face. If a person makes a mistake or is humiliated, they experience a loss of face. Mrs. Edwards, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to assume. It's no problem. I understand. Thank you. Welcome, and Section Chief Yong will meet us outside the conference room. Please follow me. Xu Xu. In China. So the idea is that in China,、um, you want to build a long-term relationship. Guanji is the term for、uh, these relationships that are very important. Politeness is important.、Uh, you don't bow in China. It's not like Japan,、um, uh, it, and that's an important、um, thing to know. Uh, maintaining face、uh, is very important.、Uh, that's something that's typical of Asian cultures、uh, in general. One doesn't want to embarrass the other person. Uh, for ex- uh, is what we're talking about with maintaining face. Chinese tend to use indirect communication style,、um, so、uh, one has to be aware of that. Um, it's great if you know a little bit of Mandarin.、Um, that can be、uh, very helpful in conducting business in China.